Okay, welcome everybody to the DJI lectures by young researchers. This week we are glad to have two lectures by Sara Bonansea, who is currently postdoc at the Niels Bohr Institute of Copenhagen. She's an expert on defect at ESFT, on holographic computations of Wilson loop and supersymmetric theories. And more recently, she has been working also in the context of holographic complexity. Um, today, she will give the first lecture, uh, while the, the second one will be tomorrow again at 11. As usual, uh, feel free to uh, mute yourself uh, and ask any question you want. I'm quite sure that Sarah will be happy to address them. Yes, of course. So, Sarah, please go on. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Alessio, for the nice introduction. And first of all, let me thank uh, the organizer for the opportunity of uh, giving these uh, lectures here on defects in conformal field theory and holography. And uh, I will start by giving you some of the main outlines uh, of these lectures. Okay, so first of all, I will start with some motivations on why it is interesting to study defects. And then um, I will uh, talk about how correlation uh, functions in CFT uh, gets modified by the presence of a defect. Okay, then I will focus uh, on um, a defect version of n equal four superior meals. That can be engineered by a D3 D5 broad brain system then I will compute the one point function for some operator in this defect CFT using integrability. And in the end, I hope to have time also to talk you uh, to, to tell you about some other observable that can be computed in this setup. And then to tell you something about also the D3, D7 brain system, which is another defect version of N equal four. And also some few words about uh, monotonicity uh, theorem for boundary theories. Okay, and the lectures of today will focus more or less on the first uh, two or three points. And uh, first of all, what is a defect? A defect is any modification of your system which is localized on a submanifold
and uh, which can be you as can be used as a tool to probe your system. And uh, of course, you can ask to yourself why it is interesting to consider defects in uh, CFT and more generally in quantum field theories. And uh, the answer is that uh, defects break uh, symmetries. as translations and rotations. And so they can uh, uh, bridge the gap between the highly symmetric and idealistic system and uh, more realistic ones. So they can be used to get closer to realistic system. For example, if you think about condensed matter system, uh, they are of finite size, so they naturally, naturally influence boundaries and uh, impurities. And uh, there are many examples of theories that uh, have been studied with um, in the presence of boundaries or defect as for example the critical Ising model with a boundary Then graphene with boundary. And we can also have various brain configuration in string theory and that can be told as defects. In M theory, for example, you can study M to brains uh, ending on M S five. Okay, and in eigenenergy physics, uh, these boundaries and interfaces can be also engineered holographically. So we have also holographic examples. And then in gauge theory, of course, also Toft loop and Wilson loops can be seen as defect. And uh, low energy examples of defect can be also uh, given by vortices. And as I said, uh, to introduce a defect in um, a conformal field theory, makes correlation function less constrained to the less amount of symmetry preserved by the defect and uh, give therefore rise to a richer theory. And um, in this lecture, we will focus on flat defect. Which are conformal. Uh, 
which means that the defect preserve a subgroup of the original conformal group of your theory. And there can also be degrees of freedom, which are localized at the defect. And uh, that makes uh, uh, the physics more interesting. And typically, if there are, not, there are not additional degrees of freedom at the defect, you uh, talk about uh, an interface. And in these lectures, uh, I will uh, talk a lot about uh, boundaries and defects because uh, they can be related by the so-called uh, uh, folding trick, as um, I will uh, explain better later. So now um, we are interested in the study of correlation function in the presence of a defect. So correlation function. in a defect CFT and to analyze that I will start by a brief recap of what happens uh, in uh, a generic uh, CFT without uh, a defect uh, focusing on dimensions uh, uh, greater than two and so a conformal transformation or coordinate is a map from x mu to x mu prime function of the old coordinate uh, that preserves the angles and which leaves the metric invariant up to a rescaling factor. Such that G mu nu is sent into e to the two omega x g mu nu. And uh, if we take g mu nu to be the Euclidean metric, the conformal group for a d-dimensional uh, CFT is uh, s o d plus one comma one. Okay, and uh, it includes the following finite transformation. We have uh, uh, translations. Then we have rotations. We have uh, scale transformations for dilatation. And then we have special conformal transformations.
And conformal invariance uh, implies that uh, your stress energy tensor is traceless. So what happens if we introduce a defect? In particular, we consider a defect of codimension one, uh, sorry, a of a codimension uh, uh, generic that we call P. in a uh, dimensional CFT. And this defect breaks the uh, Euclidean conformal group to a subgroup that uh, preserves the boundary defect, namely S O D plus one comma one is broken by the defect to S O D minus P plus one comma one times S O P where uh, this object here is the uh, conformal group preserved by the defect and this uh, other object here is the um, group of the rotation around the defect and uh, in particular a codimension p defect in a d-dimensional uh, cft which is uh, located uh, at uh, x of i equals zero, where uh, here I'm considering, I'm considering the coordinate x mu splitted in uh, x uh, of index a and x of index i, where i are the perpendicular coordinate to the defect, And I, A are the parallel coordinate to the defect. And this defect is such that the unbroken symmetries uh, constitutes a subgroup of the conformal group in the dimension, preserving x con i uh, equals zero, which is the uh, hyperplane that defines the defect. And in particular, x of i equals zero is preserved by the following generators. We have uh, the parallel translation to the defect, the parallel rotation, but also um, the transverse rotations. And then we have the dilatations and uh, the special conformal transformation uh, in the directions parallel to the defect. And notice that scale transformation rescale x con i uh, as well as the defect directions. Okay, and uh, uh, if we look at the correlation function, in CFT, what we have is that conformal symmetry imposes a strong constraint on correlation functions through the word identities. And in particular, one point function have to be zero. And you can see that uh, if you combine uh, uh, invariance under translations and invariance under scale transformations. So in general, the one point function of an operator with scala in dimension delta is zero in a CFT. And the only oper operator that uh, um, has a non-zero one point function is the identity, which is a trivial operator. And then we have two point functions.
which space-time dependence is uh, completely fixed uh, by the scaling dimensions of uh, the operators. In particular, if you consider the two-point function between uh, two scalar primaries operator, you have that it is given by m i j over x minus y to the delta i plus delta j, where m i j is zero if uh, delta i is uh, different from delta j. And uh, we can normalize uh, these operators in such a way that mij is uh, one. And then we have the three point functions. Of three scalar primary operators. And they are given by the structure constant. And the space time dependence. Okay, and the set given by the scaling dimensions of your operators and the uh, uh, structured constant that appear in the um, three point function determine uh, also the Iger point functions uh, uh, through the repeated use uh, of the OB, and they are called uh, conformal data. Now we want to understand uh, what happens to the correlation function in a conformal field theory when a defect of uh, codimension one is present. So <clears throat> we will consider a codimension one defect in what follows. Okay, and uh, as I said uh, before in the introduction, in a different conformal field theory, correlation functions are less constrained than in the usual CFT, since the defect breaks part of the symmetries. And the reduced conformal group allows, in particular, for non zero one point functions for the um, scalar primaries operators. And uh, in particular, the one point function of uh, a scalar primary operator can be written in this way. Where uh, um, x mu is given by a d minus one uh, dimensional vector. And then we have the coordinate theta, which is the coordinate perpendicular to the defect because we consider uh, the defect placed at theta equals zero. And uh, this uh, A of I is a structural constant for your defect CFT. And what is very important is that uh, A of I carries dynamical information 
both about the operator uh, and the defect. And uh, it is uh, an ambiguous since uh, the operator is properly normalized, for instance, considering uh, uh, his two-point function at asymptotic infinity, namely very far from the defect, where we assume that uh, the two-point function following as we wrote before is just the same two point function that we have if the defect is not present where we are, we are very far from the defect okay now um, one point function of uh, conformal primary field uh, with uh, a non zero lorentz spin must vanish for codimension one uh, defects. And um, if you consider the two point function, some other very interesting features arise because uh, in a defect CFT, two point functions. between uh, operators with different conformal dimensions can be different from zero. Okay, and uh, we can write this two point function in this way. Um, Okay, these operators that I'm considering here are uh, scalar primaries operator of the bulk theory, where here for bulk, I mean the 4D dimensional theory. And this is given by a function of C times 2 theta 1 to the delta 1 times 2 theta 2 to the delta two. And uh, here to write the, this two point function, we are using the convention of the boundary bootstrap program, which involves an explicit factor of two in the space time dependence. And C is the conformal ratio, which is defined in this way. And there are two interesting limits. The first one is the limit in which C goes to zero. And this corresponds to brings the two operator close together. And then we have the second limit in which C goes to infinity, which corresponds to brings the two operators close to the boundary. Then if we introduce the function G of C equal to C of delta one plus delta two over two times F of C, the two point function reads
Okay, and for two canonical normalized operator. If Sorry, take... Sarah, there is a yes. question in the chat. Yeah. Uh, what are X3 and Y3 above? Uh... Yeah. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, we are considering these. Uh, yes, sorry. I changed notation. No, they are supposed to be zeta one and zeta two. Yeah, they're, they are the perpendicular uh, direction to the defect, namely the distance from the defect of uh, the two operators that you are considering. Okay. So if you take the limit uh, of, uh, I, I hope that is clear. If there are other questions, just uh, interrupt me in any moment. So if uh, you consider the limit in which C goes to zero, G of C is to be equal to M12, because we need to recover the usual two-point function far from the defect. And so the very important things here is that much like a four-point function for a conformal field theory without boundaries of defect, we can decompose the two-point function that we have written above in conformal blocks. So decompose. Two points function in conformal blocks. And there are two different uh, decompositions. The first one is in the back channel. And uh, in this channel, we uh, consider the operator product expansion um, of two scalar primaries operator, which is given by equal to M12. plus the sum over k, lambda 1 to k, c of uh, x minus y, the derivative respect to y coordinates. OK, and so the first contribution here uh, comes from the identity operator in the OP. And the sum over k runs over uh, conformal primaries uh, with or without spin, because uh, here um, some indices about spin are left implicit. So the sum runs over conformal primaries. Okay, and then this object is a differential operator that takes into account the presence of uh, the sentence and which is uh, completely fixed by the SO T plus one comma one symmetry. And this lambda one two k here are the structure constant that can be taken real, and which are the structure constant that appear in the three point functions. Uh, without the defect. 
And the important thing to notice is that this operator product expansion is a local property of uh, your CFT in the bulk, and thus it is unaffected by the defect. And uh, now what you want to do is to insert this OBE uh, in the two-point function that we have written before. So this two-point function is of course given by the previous definition. but is also given according to the OP to this object. And then we have the sum over the scalar primers, the conformal primers. And uh, here, um, when we have the defect, we know that uh, also scalar operators can uh, have a, a non zero one point function. And this one point function will be given by A of K, the structure constant of the one point function over two zeta two to the delta K. Okay, and so using this uh, equality here, we can find uh, uh, an expression for G of C, which is equal to M12 plus the sum over K of lambda 1 to K, A of K times 2 zeta 1 to the delta 1 to zeta 2 to the delta 2. Then we have C to the delta 1 plus delta 2 over 2 times your differential operator and this uh, space-time dependence coming from the one-point function. And uh, if you work out the expression of this object, then you can uh, uh, determine the conformal blocks in this following way. And this is equal to this object. And then we have the hypergeometric function of arguments Okay, where 
this object is equal to the difference between the two scaling dimension of uh, the operators and uh, all this object here is defined as f back of delta k and of course it is also a function of the conformal ratio and that's the final form that you can find for the function g is the following And of course, then F will be written in this way. So what you have uh, found using the bulk channel is that the two-point function can be expressed in terms of uh, the scaling dimension delta of your bulk operator, the structure constant uh, lambda, and that appear in the three-point functions and the structure constants A of the uh, one-point function. And so the, the lesson is the two-point function in a deep and conformal theory exhibit a complexity uh, similar to the one of the four-point function in an usual uh, uh, CFT. And notice that uh, uh, the blocks that I've written here um, are uh, naturally defined is a series expansion around uh, x equals zero, uh, which correspond to two operators that uh, approach each other. But then you can uh, also consider another channel, which is given by the boundary channel. And uh, on the defect, we can have uh, uh, defect operators uh, that we denote as uh, O at of uh, a vector y comma zero, uh, where this notation means that uh, this operator is uh, localized uh, at the boundary. And on the defect, we have a usual uh, uh, CFT, which means that the space time dependence of the defect uh, operator two point function is completely fixed in terms of uh, the scaling dimension of the defect operator delta, which we will label as delta hat, and the uh, uh, structure constant of the defect three point function lambda hat. Okay. And uh, another important feature is that uh, we can have non-zero two-point function between uh, uh, defect operators and bulk operators. And uh, via conformal symmetry, uh, they are fixed to be of the following form.
we have the bulk operator and the defect operator and the disk is given by this object where uh, with this notation I mean simply this okay and uh, the coefficient uh, uh, m i j originates from uh, the expansion of uh, the bulk operator in terms of the bulk operator. We define the so-called bulk to bulk, bulk to defect of E. So we can write a bulk scalar scalar primary in the following way. And this uh, operator product expansion simply states that uh, when a bulk operator is brought close to the defect, it becomes uh, indistinguishable uh, from uh, a defect excitation. And uh, this first term here, it's a contribution coming from the boundary identity operator. And this sum over L uh, runs over primary boundary fields. And then this object is again a differential operator fixed completely by conformal invariance. And uh, it constructs the wall conformal family uh, for the primary operator of et appearing in the OPE. And uh, the mu i l are uh, assumed to be real and they are the bulk to boundary cuttings. And they carry physical uh, uh, information since uh, uh, both the bulk operator and the defect operator can be normalized uh, using their uh, two point functions, uh, respectively. And so this is not just uh, a normalization constant. And uh, notice that uh, um, writing the back to defect of E in this way, if I take the expectation value of this object here, I recover uh, what uh, I wrote before for the one-point function. Since the one-point function of defect operators 
uh, is uh, zero because, uh, as I said, on the defect, you have a uh, usual uh, conformal field theory in uh, D minus one uh, dimensions. And um, notice also the, the constraints of the defect conformal invariance for the correlation function of the defect operators uh, are the same uh, of these um, CFT in D minus one dimension, uh, which means that, uh, of course, uh, also the two point function and the three point function have the canonical form that I brought before uh, for a generic CFT. And um, so if I use uh, this uh, back to defect OPE and I plug it in the expression for the two point function uh, uh, of two bulk operators, I obtain the following result. And I have the two differential operators. And then I have the two point function of defects operator. And this is simply the usual two point function. Okay, which means that again, I can obtain this following identity. Sara, there is a comment uh, on the chat. Yes. From Pavan, which says that, uh, who says that uh, from the LP, the one point function seems to be diverging for uh, the one which equals to zero. Uh, I think it's true. For what, sorry? Z1, which goes to zero. Uh, yes, because, uh, yes, usually the one point function is divergent at the defect. Uh, I, I mean, you are worried about uh, convergent properties of the OPE? Or it was just a comment? Ah, he says, okay. Or okay, she... yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, we will also see that uh, it later when we will consider this uh, uh, defect version of uh, n equal for Sumerian miss in which you will give uh, vacuum expectation values to the scalars that, uh, um, the depth of the scalar will diverge at the position of the defect, which is a feature that you have uh, for domain walls usually. And which means that uh, in that setup, these fields will be um, constrained to be on the online side of the defect, as we will see better later. Uh, are there other questions? Not in the chat. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so here I was simply writing again the previous result.
Okay, and now this means that for G, you get the following expression. where this f boundary here, which is function of the scaling dimensions of the operator on the defect and of the conformal ratio, is the conformal block for uh, uh, the boundary channel and is given by, again, in terms of uh, uh, an hypergeometric function. And for example, in uh, three equal three dimensions, it is uh, uh, just an algebraic function. Okay, and so for the function f12 that appears in the one point in the two point function, we have the following results. Okay, and this first piece here uh, stems from a disconnected product of one point function. And as I say, F is the boundary. conformal block. And this boundary in conformal block uh, uh, has a good expansion when uh, uh, C goes to infinity, namely when uh, uh, both operators uh, approach the boundary. And uh, so we have obtained two expressions for the two-point function of uh, scalar primary operator. One is obtained uh, in the bulk channel and the other one is obtained using the boundary channel. But of course, these two computation uh, um, should agree. And so this give you a uh, um, crossing equation that uh, I can write you here. And that can be also okay, this is the crossing equation. Okay. 
and that can be also uh, graphically represented in this way. And this is the back channel. And this is equal, uh, sorry, this is the boundary channel. And this is equal to the back channel, where you have the, this graphically representation. Of the OP. And so we have uh, found again that uh, for the two point function computation you uh, have this crossing equation in the same way as in the usual CFT. You have also crossing symmetry and the crossing equation uh, when you compute the four-point function. And this equation uh, is very useful because uh, it can be used to constrain the space of the defect CFT. In fact, you have uh, your conformal data which are in general given by uh, the scaling dimension of the bulk and boundaries operator, the structure constants of the three-point function in the bulk and on the boundary. And then you have also uh, the structure constant coming from the one-point function of the bulk operators. And then you have the bulk to boundary scaffolding. But, uh, uh, these data are redundant because the crossing symmetry can uh, relate them. And uh, this is uh, uh, an example on how probing a theory with a boundary uh, can constrain the, the theory itself. Uh, and now maybe if you want to take a break, is a good point for me? Okay, as you prefer. I uh, yes, uh, I don't know how long, uh, it is usually five or well, five minutes. minutes. OK, perfect. OK, yeah, so we can uh, uh, come back at 12.15, uh, uh, maybe. OK. OK. Yeah, I will be I will be here if someone has questions. For... OK. And uh, so now, if you take the conformal ratio, which I defined for you before, OK, uh, this is a conformal invariant combination and if the two operators uh, O1 and O2 uh, in the bulk are chosen to be on the same side of the defect, of course uh, um, it is positive. If not, the bulk OBE is not well defined, but uh, we can solve this problem in using the folding trick. Well defined. Uh, 
Okay, and uh, by means of the folding trick, you reduce, reduce your uh, DCF, defect CFT to a boundary CFT. which means that uh, uh, conformal defects are uh, closely related to boundaries. And in particular, if you imagine to have uh, this defect theory with a CFT1 on the right-hand side of the defect and a CFT2 on the left-hand side, to the folding trick, you obtain a boundary theory. Where on the right hand side of your boundary is a CFT one times a CFT to bar, where the bar here means that uh, uh, a reflection zeta that goes into minus zeta, where zeta is the uh, perpendicular coordinate to the defect, has been applied uh, to uh, the CFT2. Okay, and uh, another important comment is that uh, in this defect CFT, uh, there is a particular new primary operator defined of the defect, uh, which is known as the, display, as the displacement operator. Uh, which encodes the effects of uh, conformal transformations um, on correlation functions in the presence of the defect. And in general, uh, there is no conserved uh, stress tensor on the defect. Uh, and this happens because the uh, energy is expected to be exchanged uh, with the bulk. And so only the global strict sensor, T mu nu total, is conserved. So we can write the following word identities. And you and this term here. Uh, means that uh, the breaking of translation invariance due to the defect appear as a delta function contribution to the divergence of the stress tensor and the displacement operator measures the discontinuity of the stress tensor across the defect.
and you can write down also the two point function for the displacement operator. where the scaling dimension of this operator is given by Q plus one, where Q is the dimension of the defect. And notice that this object here is a property of the defect conformal field theory and it's not just a normalization since the displacement operator is normalized uh, uh, by using the word identities. And in general, the relation between the bulk stress energy tensor and the displacement operator is uh, not universal in a generic uh, conformal field theory, but there can be uh, further constraints coming from supersymmetry and in some cases you can determine a simple relation between uh, uh, the stress tensor one point function coefficient and uh, the displacement uh, two points coefficient uh, um, written here. Okay, so I think that uh, this is more or less what I wanted to say uh, for how the correlation function gets modified uh, in a, a defect conformal field theory. And um, now I can focus on uh, uh, the computation of the one point function for uh, some class of operators in a defect version of uh, an equal for superior mix. And now I will review um, some features of the model that um, uh, I'm going to consider. So defect n equal for superior mix. Okay, um, so n equal for superior mills theory is a, a maximally symmetric, supersymmetric theory in uh, four dimensions. And it is also uh, one of the main uh, actor um, in one of the most established example of the ADST, the ADS CFT correspondence, which relates n equal for superior mills theory with gauge group UN. in the equal four dimensions to type to be supergravity, uh, sorry, to type to be string theory. On a 10 dimensional background, which is ADS5 cross S5. Okay, and very importantly, in the planar limit, which corresponds to take the number of colors that goes to infinity, n equal four is found to be integrable. And integrability Uh, originates from uh, classical mechanics, uh, where the Uville's theorem states that uh, if a system has uh, sufficiently many commuted conserved charges, then it is solvable by integration by quadratures. So, which means that the equation of motions can be solved by a finite set of algebraic equation.
and performing a finite <clears throat> number of integrals. And uh, uh, there is not really a version of quantum UV theorem, but exact solution can be found using the Bete ansatz techniques. So uh, if we introduce a defect in n equal four, we have that physics, of course, is uh, more rich, but is also more difficult to compute correlation functions uh, because of their uh, uh, very intricate uh, structure. But if you introduce a defect that preserves uh, integrability, then uh, uh, you still find exact solution for uh, the defect theory. In particular, we want to focus on a domain wall in uh, n equal four superior miss, which preserves half of the supersymmetries. So we will consider a one half PPS defect. of co-dimension one. And this co-dimension one defect is placed at x3 equals zero with no loss of generality and it divides the space into two regions. So here you have the defect. And this is your X3 coordinate. And uh, uh, the configuration we are uh, uh, interested in consists of two n equal four theories on each side of the defect, uh, which differ by the rank of the gauge group. So for positive value of uh, X3, we end an n equal four theory with gauge group uh, UN. And for negative values of X3, we have n equal four with gauge group un minus k, where this uh, gauge group un is broken to un minus k as the defect by some of the scalars that get a non-zero vacuum expectation value. And in particular, for positive value of X3, three of the, of the six real scalar of n equal four superior means get a bell. while for the other four scalars, these vacuum expectation values remain zero. And for negative value of X3, none of the scalars get a web. Okay, so which are the symmetries preserved by the defect? Okay, so in n equal four, we, if we consider the bosonic part of the symmetry of the theory, we have uh, S O four comma two, uh, which is the conformal group uh, in four dimensions in Lorentz signature. times SO6, which is the asymmetric group. And this is the bosonic part of uh, the superconformal group. Of n equal four. 
And this is broken by the codimension one defect to SO3,2, which is the conformal group in three dimensions preserved by the defect. times SO3, times SO3, where this is the R symmetry preserved by the defect. Okay, and um, we have that uh, uh, the following generators are preserved by the presence of the defect. We have translations along the parallel direction to the defect, where mu hat goes from one to two. Then we have uh, Lorentz transformations also in uh, along uh, x0, x1, and x2. And then we have also dilatations along all the directions. And then we have also special conformal transformations along the parallel directions to the defect. Okay, and since some supercharges, since the supercharges commute to the translation generators, this in, implies that uh, because the defect breaks. Uh, translations along the perpendicular direction, uh, some of the supercharges uh, are uh, broken. And what we consider is this one half BPS defect. And in the same way, only half of the superconformal charges preserve uh, uh, X3 equals zero, which is the location of the defect as they anti-commute to spatial conformal transformation. And uh, also the asymmetry has to be broken as, as I brought here, is broken to SO3 times SO3. And therefore the super conformal group preserved by the defect is the following. Okay, and uh, for the n equal four Bertov multiplet of uh, n equal four, um, naturally decomposes uh, with respect to uh, this super conformal group preserved by the defect into the following uh, 3D n equal four multiplets. We have a hyper multiplet. Which contains A3, I1, I2 and I3. And we have also a vector multiplet which contains a zero, a one, a two, and 
five, four, five, five, and five, six. And here I'm focusing on the bosonic part of the hyper and the vector multiple. And these are 3D n equal four multiples. And this defect that we are considering here uh, has an holographic interpretation in terms of uh, ad 3 d 5 uh, intersection. So in this configuration, uh, there are a stack of uh, n 3 3 brains. that are intersected by a single D5 for a brain, which means that uh, this uh, brain is not bad reacting. And K of the D3 brains and on the ends on the defect. So here, we have N D3. But here we have k n minus k t3 brain. And so uh, this configuration results in two different gauge groups on the left hand side and on the right hand side of the defect. And, uh, the location of the D3 and D5 brains is the following. where this intersection in along these directions uh, mimics the presence of the defect. And uh, the string theory interpretation of this setup uh, is given by uh, these D3 brains that in the near horizon limits gives you the ADS5 process 5 background and uh, uh, the probe D5 brain is a geometry given by an ADS4 inside the ADS5 times an equatorial SQ sphere inside the S5. And we have K unit of magnetic flux um, through the S2 sphere. Um, okay, and uh, as I said before, when I was talking about the uh, folding trick, boundaries and defects are, are closely related, and thus we can relate our defect, which preserves one half of the supersymmetries, to boundary conditions preserving the same, the same amount of supercharges. And there are, in general, two set of relevant boundary conditions, depending on the choice uh, of boundary condition that you assign to the n equal four uh, 3D multiplets. And a classification of this boundary condition
can be found in this paper by Gaiotto and Witte, if you are interested in it. And the first set of boundary conditions are the D5-like boundary condition. Uh, where we assign uh, a Neumann boundary conditions to the hypermultiplet. And Dirichlet boundary condition to the vector multiplet. And these boundary conditions correspond to have uh, uh, the five brains along the x0, x1, x2, x4, x5, x6 directions. And uh, they are given here at the location of the boundary. And the first two correspond to um, Dirichlet boundary condition to the vector multiplet, and then we have Neumann boundary condition for the hypermultiplet. And uh, this last equation are known as NAM equation. Where here i goes to from one to three. And this NAM equation uh, often uh, appears in the supersymmetry context. And uh, after setting, um, a3 equal to zero by a gauge choice, one gets the following equations. And uh, so NAM equations are present in general when there are D3 brains that uh, uh, end on D5 brains and they generalize the concept of uh, monopoles. And um, uh, the in the case we are interested in, uh, when there is only one uh, D5 brain, uh, a regular uh, NAM pole is present, and uh, which means that uh, the NAM equations admit a singular solution of the following form. So we have that the classical value of the fields i with index i that goes from one to three is given in this way. And these are n by n matrices and this t con i are k by k matrices. And they form a k dimensional e 
irreducible representation of SU2, which means that the commutator of Ti and Tj is given by this object. And uh, these num equations are also uh, compatible with the uh, scalar equation uh, of motion uh, that you get once you impose the following answers. That a mu is equal to zero, that psi is equal to zero, that phi one, two, three, depend only on x3 and that phi uh, and this is basically what you get from the boundary conditions and so you have that the scalar equation of motion are the following Okay, and the solution that I've written here to the NAM equation is, of course, a solution also of the scalar equation of motion. And uh, uh, this solution provides a background uh, around which you can uh, uh, perturbatively quantize, as we will do tomorrow. And then uh, let me finish the lesson for today. Uh, writing for you also the second type of uh, boundary condition that you can have, which are the NS5 like boundary conditions. And uh, they come from the fact that you can perform an um, S duality. Which maps the um, the three brains into themselves. And the D5 brains are mapped into NS5 brains along X0, X1, X2, x7, x8, and x9 direction, which means that we make a, a special rotation exchanging x4, x5, and x6 with x7, x8, and x9, and vice versa. And this boundary condition are the following. So now we have Dirichlet boundary condition on the hypermultiplet and Neumann boundary condition for the vector multiplet. And here, when I uh, write down the boundary condition, I um, focus on the bosonic part. And uh, uh, what is remarkable at, uh, is that in that case, there are no unfolds. And we can do the following comments. So if the parameter K is equal to zero, where K, uh, remember, is the parameter that uh, governs the web in the setup, uh, it means that uh, there are no D3 ending 
on the D5 brain. So uh, on the defect, uh, there is a localized hypermultiplet. And there are no numpoles since there are no D3 brains ending on the D5 brains. And thus we have uh, an N equal for superior miss theory coupled to a 3D uh, superconformal field theory. And the action of this 3D superconformal field theory is known from this nice paper here. By the Wolf, Friedman, and Oguri. Then if K is equal to one means that uh, we have the gauge group un for positive values of extreme and un minus one for negative values of extreme and there are no extra interface matter on the defect And all the vets are zero at the classical level. And when K is bigger than one, What we have is that numpole are present. Uh, in the D5 case. And there are no extra degrees of freedom on the defect. And when we consider the NS5 brain picture, what we have is that the defect supports a B fundamental hypermultiplet also in the K bigger than one case. So I think that for today, uh, this is everything uh that i wanted to say and tomorrow we will uh, restart by computing the one point function for some class of operator in the in this uh, uh d3 d5 brain setup using some integrability techniques so if there are questions feel free to ask okay thank you very much sara are there any questions I'm Luigi. Hi, Luigi. Thank you for the lecture. I might have a, a question. Yeah. Uh, how much of this setup survive uh, if you reduce uh, the supersymmetry? I mean, is there anything similar if you have n equal to two in uh, four dimension? Uh, 
Uh, I know that uh, there are some papers by some Japanese guy, I guess, where they consider uh, like one half supersymmetry. I don't know uh, if can be useful, but if you have n equal to, um, I don't know exactly, but I know that if, for example, you consider uh, only uh, one over four supersymmetries, um, yeah, there can be also some problems in classifying uh, all these defects, but uh, yeah, I don't know if maybe I miss something and uh, there have been other words about that. Okay, I see. Thank you. Other questions? If not, I, I think we can stop uh, the recorded part of the lecture.